Defense lawyers in the Young Thug YSL RICO trial filed an ass load of motions today. The state also filed two motions, one of them being requesting defense lawyers to stop talking to the media. Yeah, boy, we got some motions for a mistrial with no retrial. Thug is trying to get a bond again, saying that he'll have 24-7 armed guards around his house keeping him in his house with an ankle monitor. And also the state screwed up their whole exhibit list. You'll see at the end of the video, it's pretty shocking. I don't know how this happened, but Brian Steele points it out. Hit subscribe, join the channel membership. Here we go, boys. All right, first document we got right here is Yakati's renewed motion for bond. Kendrick is currently being held in Fulton County Jail for over two years. Denied bond in 2022 and 2023. To date, state has presented almost 100 witnesses with no end in sight. While the state has argued that Kendrick is a threat to the community, none of the state's 100 witnesses have presented any testimony demonstrating that threat. The state has seven months to do so and has failed. Since the denial of bond the state has offered and entered plea agreements with a bunch of other defendants right here so they're pointing out the hypocrisy that they offer these people plea deals but then earlier they were saying they were threats to the community which is kind of funny <laughs> how are you gonna let them walk free but you were saying they were threats like a month ago one must now question how much of a threat the state truly believes those defendants pose yakati poses no significant threat or danger to any person to the community or any property in the community and will not jeopardize the safety of the community if admitted to bail in this case kendrick poses no significant risk of committing any crime pending trial. Kendrick poses no risk of intimidating witnesses or otherwise obstructing the administration of justice. Kendrick assures the court that he won't flee, blah, blah, blah. Will the judge do this? I'm not sure because they do say that Kendrick was in the car that killed Donovan Thomas. At least that's what the state alleges. So, you know, it's up to the judge to uh, potentially let out a guy that was in a car that killed people. Who knows? Next document, Yakati's motion for a mistrial. So we all knew this was coming. This was Doug Weinstein's motion for a mistrial here. Let's get into it, boys. The state has had witnesses fail to provide the testimony that it would like the jury to hear. Rarely in recent history of Fulton County Superior Court has one party had to impeach so many witnesses of its own, including at least the following witnesses, Trontavia Stevens, Walter Murphy, Miss Bennett, Eduardo Navo Flores, Adrian Bean, D'Angelo White, and critically, Kenneth Copeland. So that's all the witnesses the state had to impeach that were their own witness. <laughs> so far what is the state to do losing its case apparently unconcerned about the need for public justice the state clearly saw an opportunity to restart the trial by triggering an event in such egregious violation of the constitutional rights of kendrick that he would have no choice but to request a mistrial now goaded by the state and the actions of chief judge glanville kendrick has no option but to move this court for mistrial to respect the constitutional rights of kendrick and not defeat the ends of public justice while this trial has been riddled with scores of errors at least three demand an immediate mistrial so remember weinstein pointed out in that interview that he was going to say they were goaded and basically forced to into this position out of their control placed in an impossible position by the state this court is faced with the task and requirement to reset this case at least to the point of afternoon june the 12th when kendrick moved chief judge glanville to recuse himself and he improperly failed to halt all proceedings pending determination of recusal since that date the jury heard days of testimony from kenneth copeland testimony that can't be unheard yakati's constitutional rights were violated when neither he nor his attorneys were present at a critical stage of the proceeding the secret ex parte meeting third his due process rights were violated when chief judge glanville wrongly coerced Copen to testify. Hey, Mr. Copen, you're going to be jailed for years on end if you don't get up on that stand. None of these above three reasons for mistrial would exist absent the state's intention to goad Kendrick into the unfortunate position of having to regretfully request a mistrial. Now, this section is about unwinding the few days of testimony. He cites Propst versus Morgan. If a party files a motion to recuse a trial judge, the motion is denied, but is later determined that the judge should have been disqualified to act in the case. All proceedings after the filing motion to recuse are invalid and of no effect. So that's what Brian Steele cited in in the first day of his motion, he's probably going to do the same thing. Under props, I think that's how you pronounce it. All proceedings since the afternoon of June 12th are invalid and have no effect. This honorable court is now saddled with the repercussions of Chief Judge Glanville's failure to file... <laughs> To follow Rule 25, he should have halted all proceedings as required under Rule 25 and referred Kendrick's motion recused for assignment to another judge. Nevertheless, he persisted. Under repeated objections from Kendrick and other counsel, the tainted testament of Copeland was put into the jury over the course of four days, June 12th, 13th, 14th, and 17th. During that time, Glanville, who should have been disqualified, repeatedly ruled against Kendrick and other defendants on multiple objections regarding the questioning of Copeland. Now this court is tasked with unringing the bell. How is this court going to accomplish this impossible task? How does the court take the jurors' notes from these days? How can the jury unhear days and days of testimony? This is not a matter of a witness uttering a single statement that a court instructs the jury to disregard. <laughs> it is neither feasible nor plausible that an instruction to disregard days of testimony can be followed. It's a good point. I mean, it's going to be extremely hard to tell the jury, hey, remember these days right here? All your notes, everything you heard that day, deleted out of your brain. How is that humanly possible? Instructing someone to not picture flying elephants only results in the listener conjuring images of Dumbo. <laughs> 
Bro, Weinstein's funny as hell. Defense were not provided notice of the hearing of the ex parte. He cites Allen vs. State. The outcome of the case is substantially affected by the bullying of Copeland into changing his mind regarding testifying. Copeland is a key witness to the state's allegation that Kendrick was involved in the murder of Donovan Thomas. While the case against Kendrick is weak, at best, even with the testimony of Copeland, without Copeland, the state is virtually nothing attaching Kendrick to the murder of Thomas. The ex parte meeting with Copeland was thus a critical stage of the trial in which Kendrick had a right to participate. It's a good point. The state really doesn't have anything to put Kendrick in the car. Besides Woody. Kendrick's constitutional rights and due process field trial have been violated by the above actions and state's actions in working with Chief Judge Glanville on the coercion has intentionally goaded Kendrick into the only possible outcome. This motion for Miss Charlotte should be granted by this court. And then he talks about Glanville violating judicial code of conduct. We've heard that a million times. A trial judge in his chambers, in cooperation with prosecutors surrounded by investigators and law enforcement, coerced Copeland with the threat of years of jailing. Not a good look. The state and the judge exerted such duress to preclude Copeland from making a free and voluntary choice whether to testify. Therefore, Kendrick respectfully, regretfully requests the honorable court to declare mistrial based on these reasons above, blah, blah, blah. Now we got SB, Shannon Stilwell's motion for fair and constitutional trial. This case has been plagued by discovery violations, loss of missing police reports, and Brady violations. The defense also takes issue with several of Judge Glanville's legal rulings. Talking about the ex parte here. The defense has completely neutralized all testimony and documentary evidence presented against Mr. Stilwell, thus far. In other words, the defense is winning the trial. <laughs> the defense is winning despite the persistent legal errors, Brady violations, ex parte meetings, and discovery issues that have plagued this case. Mr. Stilwell does not request to start this case over. Serious errors have tainted this trial, prohibit Stilwell from receiving a fair trial, from confronting witnesses called against him. Due process rights have been violated. These errors are described in detail in Williams and Kendrick motions, have been called solely by Fulton County District Attorney's Office in Glenville. These errors cannot be cured by curative instructions and will ultimately prevent these proceedings from meeting federal and state constitutional requirements, adhering to the Georgia Rules of Evidence, and fulfilling the requirements of Brady. So that's Max Shart's motion right there. He's basically saying he's going to adopt whatever Brian Steele says. Now, another Max Shart document for Shannon Stilwell right here. Motion for reconsiderations regarding certain hearsay statements. So this is about Woody's testimony in general, the admissibility of Woody's testimony. Stilwell is charged with the January 10th alleged murder of Donovan Thomas and count two of this indictment. Kenneth Copeland, a witness called by the state, is currently on the witness stand. Mr. Copeland has never claimed to have any firsthand knowledge regarding the death of Donovan Thomas. Woody did, however, meet with law enforcement several times in 2015 on June 10th and what was Copeland's fifth meeting with law enforcement Mr. Copeland told law enforcement that he possessed specific information regarding the shooting death of Donovan Thomas Mr. Copeland made this claim while under the threat of arrest for unrelated crimes that law enforcement was investigating Copeland did not mention this information in prior meetings at all on June 10th he told law enforcement that he picked up Demekia and Garlington at McDonald's on Cleveland Avenue the evening that Donovan Thomas was killed Copeland reported that Garlington walked to Copeland's car and while the two men were briefly alone Garlington told Copeland that they killed not Copeland told law enforcement that Garlington then pointed to a group of people who were pulling into the McDonald's. He told law enforcement that he interpreted Garlington's words and actions to mean that Stilwell, Kendrick, Justin Cobb, and Demise McMullen were all present for and participated in the drive-by shooting of Donovan Thomas. Per Copeland, Demise McMullen entered his car shortly after Garlington and all his communication about the event ceased. So that's literally it. That's all the state has that put these guys in the car is Woody's word. <laughs> that these boys pulled up to a McDonald's. Kind of crazy, right? To me, that doesn't seem like that's a lot. Like, I need to see more. I need to see, like, some phone tracking or something. On direct examination, Copeland has not denied making this June 10th, 2015 statement. Copeland has refused the contents and veracity of this prior statement. He testified at trial that this conversation with Garlington never occurred, and that he fabricated the event to get himself out of legal trouble. Stowell has challenged the admissibility of Garlington's out-of-court statements on hearsay and confrontation clause grounds. Glanville, who has been recused from this case, ruled that these statements were admissible as statements of a co-conspirator. One, establish the existence of a conspiracy. Two, show that the statement was made during the pendency of the conspiracy, but that proponent must also establish that the statement was made in furtherance of the conspiracy. Assuming that Garlington actually said these things to Copeland, these statements were not made in furtherance of the conspiracy. The statements that spill the beans, by definition, do not further a conspiracy. All right, guys, this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Therapy can help with better relationships, stronger coping skills, and a better sense of who you are as a person. And a lot of you watching this video have gone through something traumatic, and it's always good to talk to someone and get that out and not harbor it and keep it inside. And this is why BetterHelp is amazing because it's all online. You don't have to go in person. It's so convenient and flexible and you can fit it in your busy schedule. We all know life is all about having fun and having a clear mindset. Mental health is very important and BetterHelp can be something that impacts your life in a positive way in your work life and your personal life. I've personally witnessed family members and friends go to therapy and then months later they come out a completely different person. I've seen it firsthand. The positive impacts of therapy are insane and BetterHelp is the most convenient way to get therapy. All you got to do is go to betterhelp.com cuff and get 10% off your first 
first month. You fill out a questionnaire and you get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can change the therapist at any time if you feel you need a new one. Prioritize your mental health and go to betterhelp.com. That's better, H E L P.com slash cuff and get 10% off your first month. Hell of a deal, boys. I really appreciate you all watching. Go to BetterHelp right now. Go talk to someone. Trust me, it's worth it. Back to the video, boys. See Stafford versus State, State versus Lane, and State versus Wilkins, US versus Blakey. All right. So the spill the bean statements do not further a conspiracy. At least that's what he's saying. Who knows if that's actually what the judge is going to agree with or not. The state plans to elicit testimony from Copeland regarding Garlington's alleged statements. While Copeland is now denying that Garlington made any such statements, Copeland has openly acknowledged that he previously told law enforcement that Garlington made statements. The state has attempted to improperly introduce the contents of Garlington's statements through recordings of Copeland's prior statements. The state's method is improper for two reasons, boys. First, Copeland has not denied making these prior statements, and therefore no foundation for prior inconsistent statements have been laid. Second, which is the focus of the motion, Garlington's statements to Copeland, even if uttered, were not made in furtherance of the conspiracy and therefore fail to meet the requirements of OCGA 24-8-801. All right, boys. Who knows what the judge is going to rule on that one? He's citing some cases, though. All right, now we have a state's motion to exclude victim character evidence. The state believes the defense in the above style case may attempt to improperly place the character of the deceased victim, Mr. Donovan Thomas Jr., and issue at the trial of this case. The state moves this court to prohibit any attempt by the defense to elicit and introduce improper character evidence. So now they cite some OCGA statutes right here. These statutes generally limit evidence of a victim's character to reputation or opinion and not specific bad acts. Evidence of a person character or a trait of a character shall not be admissible for the purpose of proving an action and conformity therewith on a particular occasion. Generally, a murder victim's character is irrelevant and inadmissible, cites Walker versus State. A victim's character may only be admitted if there exists some factual nexus to the conclusion for which it is being offered. It is impermissible to establish such nexus through sheer speculation. The character of Donovan Thomas Jr. is irrelevant and inadmissible in this trial because there exists no factual nexus for introducing any evidence pertaining to his character. Any evidence of the victim's character is unequivocally irrelevant because no defendant has claimed self-defense. Even if the court were to find a relevant purpose for the victim character evidence, it could only permit admission through reputation and opinion testimony. All right, so the state doesn't want any dirt on Diamond Thomas coming in the trial at all. Now we have another state's motion to restrict extrajudicial statements. So the state doesn't want defense lawyers talking to the media in any way. They're trying to put a muzzle on the defense lawyers, which I don't think is right, to be honest. Like defense lawyers should be allowed to speak to whoever the f they want. What? This is in America, but whatever. Let's see what their reasoning is here. So they cite Georgia Rule of Professional Conduct Rule 3.6 right here. With criminal jury trials being the most sensitive to extrajudicial speech, the character, credibility, reputation of a party, and any opinion as to the guilt or innocence of a defendant are subjects deemed to be more likely to have a material prejudicial effect on a criminal proceeding. All right. Defense counsel have made numerous extrajudicial statements explicitly about this case while a jury is sworn and seated during the state's case in chief. Brian Steele and Keith Adams, Kendrick counsel attorney Doug Weinstein, Stillwell's lawyer attorney Max Shar have all made extrajudicial statements to the media violating Rule 3.6, interviews, and statements to the Associated Press. State thus moves this honorable court to instruct the defense to refrain from making any extrajudicial statements, blah, blah, blah. All right, Miss Love. Exhibit A. Wait, this is the statement that Thugger Daily tweeted out. <laughs> That's funny as shit. She's putting <laughs> exhibits from Thugger Daily in here. It's a Brian Steele statement to Thugger Daily. <laughs> And now an infamous Sylvia interview, an Associated Press article, a Megan Cuniff interview, Megan Cuniff interview with Max Shart. You get the picture. The state doesn't want the defense lawyers talking, but I feel like they're just trying to cut their tongue out and not have them talk to anyone, which is fucked up, but whatever. Apparently they have the power to do that. Mr. Harvey right here is the lawyer for Mr. Nichols. He filed a motion as well. Motion for a mistrial objection to mid-trial substitution of the trial judge. So I knew people were going to have the issue with that. Like, how can a new judge come in out of nowhere? It makes absolutely no sense. Mr. Nichols moves for a mistrial and objects to a mid-trial substitution of the trial judge because here, for a judge to be substituted after 19 months of a trial, including six months of testimony and the admission of evidence prejudices the defense right to a fair trial under the 6th and 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. This court will be unable to adequately evaluate the entirety of the prior proceedings. I literally said that. I was like, how does she know anything? She's literally admitted that she has been following the case. Of the 19 months of trial, over six months has been testimony for which this court was not present and therefore cannot base its decision on what has occurred during the trial. This court already admitted that she was unfamiliar with the previous trial proceedings that have occurred over the last year and a half. Glanville made decisions saying he would revisit it later on. Given the fact that the current court is unfamiliar with over six months worth of testimony, arguments by parties, motions by the parties, and contingent rulings, this court could not possibly make decisions. Great points from Mr. Harvey right there. All right, now we got Brian Steele's motions for bond and brief in support of pre-verdict bond for Jeffrey Williams. The presumption of innocence remains with the person accused of 
an offense, even a capital offense from arrest and even during trial. Courts view the criminally accused to be innocent of the charges waged against him or her. Mr. Williams is not a flight risk. To meet this burden, Mr. Williams must first present evidence showing his roots in the community, which would include the length and character of residence in the community, employment status, and past history of responding to legal process. Williams was born and raised in the Jonesboro South section of Atlanta. Days before the return of the original indictment and arrest of Mr. Williams, Williams returned to Atlanta from the country of Norway. He's one of 11 children. There's not many among us who have stronger roots in our community than Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams has been working since he was six years old. Williams was signed by Atlanta Records and was paid $1 million. Williams is currently gainfully employed, tirelessly works at his artistry and other lawful business ventures, modeling, clothing lines, owner of a successful record label and various investments. Williams has never missed nor been late to a court appearance, has a history of responding to the legal process, undersigned counsel is in possession of his passport, and has permission to surrender this passport as directed by the Honorable Court for purposes of bond. Free at last bonding company has agreed to write a bond set by this Honorable Court. Free at last bonding company are motivated to keep track of Mr. Williams and prevent any possible flight. Mr. Williams intends to present witnesses to testify at the renewed bond hearing. Williams' parents, managers, and members of his record label, childhood friends, and business associates will be present in court to testify. Williams is not a significant threat to the community or any person or any property in the community. Williams has taken the initiative to secure the commitment of full-time, off-duty sworn law enforcement officers to watch his home and secure him in his home 24-7, seven days a week. If house arrest is ordered by the Honorable Court as a condition of pre-verdict bond, Williams will also submit to wearing an ankle monitor. Any person to visit him would have to be approved by the Honorable Court. Any visitor will consent to being searched physically. Williams agrees that all forms of communication will be given over to the Honorable Court if needed be. All costs will be incurred by Mr. Williams for these off-duty police officers. With these parameters in mind, it cannot be said that Mr. Williams would be a threat or danger to the community or any person in the property. So this is something they brought up in the other bond hearing, I believe, and it still got denied by Glanville. <laughs> So who knows? Bro would basically just be in his house surrounded by police officers with an ankle monitor on. <laughs> How would he do anything physically himself? Williams is not a significant risk to commit a felony out on bond. Drugs and weapons were found in his home when he was arrested. At the time, there were numerous people at the home. This is because other people lived at the home because he has several homes in the area. Thus, Mr. Williams is not a significant risk to commit a felony while out on bond, especially with the use of the security and other conditions offered above. So here's a big one. Mr. Williams is not a significant risk to intimidate witnesses or obstruct the administration of justice. Mr. Williams has suggested all calls, text messages, and other means of communication are to be monitored safe, privileged communications, and additionally, he will be secure in his home when not present in court. This will prevent any possibility to intimidate a witness or otherwise obstruct the administration of justice via electronic means. Williams is a respected, high-profile artist who has positively impacted lives of others who would otherwise never break the poverty line. Williams has made a tremendous positive impact on our community. Williams is a positive member of society. Will the judge give him bond? I don't know, dude. I doubt it, honestly. I don't even know if the trial is continuing, so who knows any of this, dude. So here's a big motion right here by Brian Steele and Keith Adams. Motion to correct discrepancies concerning Mr. Williams' trial exhibits. After a review of the YSL exhibit status Excel spreadsheet provided to undersigned counsel by this honorable court, Mr. Williams has identified the following exhibits which were admitted at trial but not recorded as such. So all these exhibits are here. DW1, DW2, DW3, 4, 7, 22, 26, 31, 34, 35, 42, and 43. 44, 60, 60 A, 61, 62 A, 63, 64, 65, 66, 69, 72, 222 A. All these exhibits were not admitted. They weren't on the sheet that was provided. How does something like that even happen? I'm so lost. Moreover, the following exhibits were not admitted at trial. However, the Honorable Court Reporter has marked same as being admitted on the YSL Exhibit Status Excel Spreadsheet. DW8 not admitted into evidence, DW10 not admitted into evidence, and he's linking where they are admitted on the stream. <laughs> Like he's like, here, Glenville admitted them in the evidence right here. It's on live stream. Furthermore, the following exhibits have been admitted in this case at bar. However, these exhibits are not listed in the YSL exhibit status, Excel spreadsheet. More exhibits right here. So shout out Thugger Daily for tweeting this. This is all the pending motions. Thug has a bond motion, mistrial, new retrial. <laughs> Disqualify Love and Hilton. Strike all of Woody's testimony. Challenge previous judge rulings. Bond. Mistrial. No retrial. Yakati. Bond. Mistrial. No retrial. SB. Mistrial. No retrial. Reconsider Glanville's ruling allowing Woody hearsay to reach jury. Nichols. Mistrial due to issues as a result of a new judge coming in this late. Mr. Huey also filed a motion for bond. That happened a few days ago, but I didn't report on it because I just was waiting for more shit because I knew all the motions were coming today because it was a deadline. And the state's two motions right here about nuts evidence and defense attorneys talking about the case. So that's pretty much it.
for today, boys. The state is going to respond, I think, within like a day or two or something like that, or by the end of the week, I think. So all my videos are now on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, the audio only for anyone that has to listen to them at work. Join the channel membership. It's only 10 cents per day. I really appreciate all the support, boys. For real. Love you guys. Hit subscriber now. Peace out. Time.